All right, my English teacher friends. So at the time of recording this video, we're about three weeks away from taking the AP literature exam. And I'm pretty active in the Facebook groups and in the LinkedIn communities, Instagram. And I know that a lot of teachers assign how to read literature like a professor by Thomas C. Foster. Yet at this stage of the game, you know, right before the exam, a lot of teachers are saying, my kids get the writing aspect. They're pretty decent writers. I'm not too concerned about the, uh, about the writing aspect of the exam. They're terrible multiple choice test takers. And ultimately, it comes down to this for me. Even though we are assigning how to read literature like a professor, our students do not know how to read like a professor. And, you know, they can read all, you know, 320 pages of that book, and it doesn't really augment or enhance their ability to read whatsoever. My students practice their reads a lot, and oftentimes, especially for those that are familiar with my work, you know that I do a lot of edutainment. I do a lot of gamification. So I took uh, Thomas C. Foster's ideas and gamified it into a version of Ned's head. And what I'll do in this video is walk you through how we did a Ned's head exercise with a roadkill poetry unit. So in this, um, in my roadkill poetry unit, in, in this video, I'm going to show you Mary Oliver's The Black Snake, but we had other poems in there. There are a ton of good poems like Traveling Through the Dark, Death of the Toad, Shooting Rats at the Bibb County Dump, and Small Frogs Killed on a Highway. I ended up having about 10, 10 such poems like that in the roadkill unit. But for this one, as I said, I'll show you Mary Oliver's Black Snake and run you through the whole exercise so that you'll be able to implement it in your classroom. So without further ado, let me jump right into this. So in terms of setup and rules, one of the things that I have in my classroom is an easel. It's a big, big easel, and I have these Velcro um, laminate lit terms that we attach to it. So whether it be an on-level class where we're analyzing literature or for AP Lit, when we discover a new literary term device technique, we attach it to our easel. So here we are, it's the middle of April. We have seen everything that we need to see in preparation for the AP literature exam. That board is loaded with terms, devices, techniques. So what I do is this. I model for my students how to read like a professor. So what I'll do is I'll go and, you know, read a particular poem. In this case, it's the black snake. And I'll take all the terms, devices, techniques off that board and stuff them into Ned's head. Oftentimes, I tell my students this, good reading is making good observations. I think that's what, you know, professors do. I think that's what good readers do. They make the observations. And in terms of reading for poetry and prose, and again, this, this goes to those that are familiar with my templates in particular. So I have my students invert the thesis. And they answer two questions. What is the authorial intent and how does the author construct meaning? As long as kids can read a poem or read a prose passage and answer those two questions and ascertain the meaning of a text, they're going to be good as long as they're using templates and have a general understanding of how to crank out an essay and do so with the time constraints. So what I do is take all the terms, devices, techniques, and I shove them in Ned's head. And what we do is we gamify it. So I have, you know, class set up as teams. I usually like to have four or five teams for this exercise. And one person from the team will come and pull a, uh, a lit term device technique out of Ned's head, and then they need to dissect it and elucidate it in the poem. So let's say, for example, that, you know, team number one comes up to Ned's head, and we're dealing with Mary Oliver's Black Snake, and we get light, dark imagery. So they have to explore the juxtaposition of the light, light and dark imagery in the poem, get in, get the textual support, get the textual analysis, and explain to class how that juxtaposition works within the poem. 
and we just go through all the terms, devices, techniques that way. If a team, you know, gives an inadequate response or a wrong response, then it defers to the next team. And of course, you can gamify those rules however you want. It's not really that, you know, exacting how you uh, how you do it. So let me just do a quick, quick run through of how we would do this. So we, uh, you know, think think in terms of this. You, you, you dress a poem the same way that you dress a professor, right? Poetry does the same thing over and over and over again. And that's what I emphasize with my students. Theoretically, technically, there's only so many things at a poet's disposal, right? It's like I, I, I write poetry, I play guitar, there's a glass ceiling. Like there's only so many things you can do. Uh, on a guitar. There's only so many things you can do when you compose a poem. And when you're dressing a professor, he has to look a certain way. So what I do is I just, you know, stuff that head with uh, the terms, the devices, the techniques. So let's say a student pulls out this uh, term, authorial intent. In order to get the uh, thesis point, you have to get to the authorial intent, which is theme, universal truth, uh, the exigence, however you want to splice that. So here's another one that always comes up in poetry, the syntactical flares. So as you're reading through this poem, there are so many nuanced things going on at the syntactical level that if the student were to write the essay about this, I would need for them to make that uh, those observations. And if this poem were ever featured on an AP exam, you know, I, I think the college board readers would expect uh, students to make these real good deep syntactical reads but here's the kicker right as you read traveling through the dark and death of a toad shooting rats at the bibb county dump small frogs killed on a highway the exact same syntactical maneuvers that mary oliver uses all of those poems use as well so what we do is one poem at a time and go through all the poems just plain ned's head and students are like oh my god the same stuff keeps recurring over and over and over and over again. There's light dark binaries. Uh, you know, there's uh, all the same syntactical flares and uh, the same binaries keep coming up over and over and over again. So let me just show you real quick what we have here. So I've already alluded to this, the light dark imagery, the juxtaposition between the light and the dark imagery. Uh, has meaning. One thing that I spy with my little eye in reading The Black Snake that I hope my students would pick up on, I see a lot of circular imagery in there. Good observation. So what? So I made the observation. I need for my students to get to the so what of that, right? Observation making is fine, but you got to take it one step further. How does the circular imagery construct the meaning in the poem? So with poetry in terms of getting the authorial intent and the construction of meaning, you always have to identify the theme or the universal truth. And uh, in terms of uh, characterization, students would really have to unpack the characterization of that black snake as they would the deer in William Stafford's Traveling Through the Dark, the toad in Death of the Toad, the rats in Shooting Rats at the Bibb County Dump, and Small Frogs Killed on a Highway. The characterization is huge. And I think sometimes students want to shoot for the stars in terms of identifying their terms, devices, techniques. And simple things like setting and characterization often get overlooked. And we need to analyze those things. So they're very important to the construction of the meaning of the poem. All right. So one thing that I see in here is a lot of contrast between life and death imagery. It ties to the theme. It, it ties to the authorial intent. And that's one of the cool things that exercises like this do. In terms of writing the essay, I don't want my students to do one paragraph tone, one paragraph uh, characterization, one paragraph juxtaposition. I want them to be able to synthesize the terms, the devices, techniques, and weave them together. And again, my students use a template called the syllogistic method for their body paragraphs, and they're doing something called a multitask first premise, where they begin to link and unify the terms, the devices, techniques together in their literary arguments. So, Another thing that I spy in here are the uh, pronouns, you know, the it, what part of speech is it, and then the significance. Why does 
you know, Mary Oliver, all of a sudden towards the end of the poem, get focused really heavily on the it. And in the other poems, guess what? The pronouns matter, right? And the conjunctions as well. So you always have to look for parts of speech when you're analyzing poetry. So that was just a quick video rundown of how to do Ned's Head really practice reads uh, as we prepare for the exam or if you're doing on-level courses. Um, you know, the reading matters. It's connected to the writing. So if you uh, are interested in having these slides, just email me, teachingwritingcoach at gmail.com. Also know that I'm a lead teacher for the National Writing Project. We have PD throughout the year. So as we come upon the summer months, we're going to be doing quite a bit. So if you're interested in getting some PD from me or the National Writing Project, visit my website at teachinghowtowrite.com. So be well. Happy teaching. Happy writing.